to Just Mission, everybody. I'm Mitch Mitchy. I'm your host. I have Abe here and a very, very talented and special guest. We have Greg Kindler with us. Kindler? Did I say it right? Kindler, you got it. Kindler. All right, perfect. Greg, how are you doing? I'm doing well. How are you guys doing tonight? Doing fantastic. Great. I mean, I'm excited. <laughs> We're going to talk baseball. We're going to talk old baseball, which not a lot of people like really know much about You know the golden era of baseball and can talk it. And, like, especially, like, in our age realms. Yeah. Wait, how old are you guys? I mean, I, I'm 28. I'm 25. Oh, my God, you're babies. Uh, <laughs> to be 25 and 28 again. <laughs> oh, geez. You're not that old. You, what are you, 38? I'm 40. Oh, that's not bad at that's all. Bad. That's, like, still kind of in, like, the sta- same sports realm-ish a little bit. Like, yeah. I, I, a little <laughs> bit. I mean, I have, like, I mean, so my dad's 49, so I very much grew up with knowing that era of sports like i can tell you everything about the 80s brewers the 80s packers because he grew up in milwaukee i don't know much about the 80s bucks i'm not a big basketball guy but yeah brewers and that stuff so what got you in like like what's the origin story for like your love for baseball in the first place uh well the the origin story i guess for the game itself like i i know that when i was a baby my parents actually used to take me to games uh i don't know if that's because they wanted me to be exposed to it or they just couldn't find a babysitter um (laughs) but uh you know i guess maybe it's kind of ingrained in there somewhere because of that uh but i also at a a young age i uh i discovered my my uh father's baseball card collection or at least the remnants of it what remained what his mother did not throw away um and yeah you know he he would kind of like he would sit me down on the proverbial knee and be like, Oh, you know, this is, this is Mickey Mantle. This is Yogi Berra. You know, this is Roger Maris. These are the heroes that I had when I was growing up, when I was a kid. So, uh, I think, you know, at a young age, I kind of, um, I guess I just identified with those people and they seemed very real and alive to me. If that makes sense. Well, you're named after a baseball player, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, yes, yeah. I was, I was named, uh, I was named after Greg Nettles, the uh, the Yankee third baseman of the uh, '70s and early '80s. Um, my father, you know, big Yankee fan, and he liked Greg Nettles a lot and really loved how he played uh, third base. Uh, but also, I think my mother saw the spelling at some point and really liked that. So I think. It might be like more like my mother saw the spelling and she liked it more than my dad loving Greg Nettles, but whatever, I'll take it. <laughs> well, I was reading. Wasn't your isn't your mom a like a, a Brooklyn Dodgers fan? Didn't she more originate originate to that side of the yeah. of the world? So that's yeah. interesting. How did how did that work between them? Because I mean that was quite the rivalry. <laughs> yeah, a little I, bit. I, to this day, I don't know how it worked out. I mean, they've been, <laughs> they've been together for almost uh, almost 50 years now. But uh, I, I think my mother is more of a, a casual, you know, more of a casual Brooklyn Dodgers fan. Uh, whereas my father is definitely more of like a rabid, uh, you know, four sport, like nuts and bolts kind of guy. Uh, so I don't know if they really clashed all that okay. much, thankfully. Who, who's your team then? Are you a Yankees fan? I'm a Yankees fan, but I, uh, I mean, you know, I, I like baseball just kind of as a whole, you know, in general. So I'm happy to watch really any I game. I mean, it's yeah. baseball. I was just excited we got baseball this year. I didn't think it was going to happen. I agree. I, I'm still not sure it's going to stay, but. Uh, yeah, we'll see. I mean, we're 20, 20 some games in. How, uh, do you have any projects going on with like the new way baseball is looking with like out fans in the stands? I I don't about anything like that. I have. Um, Normally, I don't. I don't normally gravitate towards uh, painting modern players, but every now and then I do. Um, But there is something really um, appealing, but also odd about you know imagery of like you know a guy, you know jumping for a catch, uh, you know, on the third baseline or something. And, you know, he makes the catch and you see empty seats plus cardboard cutouts and, uh, you know, like teddy bears or whatever. It's just so strange. But <laughs> at the same time... It's 2020. <laughs> yeah, but at the same time, it's so amazing. Like, 
there's there's no fans, and this is a sport where fans flock to the game. Like even the casual person, like baseball, I think is the best game to take somebody who's not a sports fan because yeah. you can talk about it, like just have talk and not really have to pay attention to what's going on. And then the ball gets hit, and then they go, "What happened?" And then you can tell them real quick. It's not like basketball or football where there's kind of always constant action going on. I mean, if you know baseball, it's a very complex sport, but at the same time. Uh, they said it best in Bull Durham. You hit the ball, you throw the ball, you catch the ball. Right, right, yeah. But, it, yeah, you're right. I mean, it's a very conversational sport, and, it, you know, you can have a, a, a social interaction with the people around you. And, uh, you know, you don't – you can go to the, the ballpark and enjoy the game without necessarily even taking the game in, which is kind of cool, I think. Right, that's – yeah, exactly. And then so getting into, like, your art, are you self-taught or did you go to school for artwork? Like, where did the art, like, were you always an artist growing up? Or, like, was that something, like, Blake, how Blake came into it later in life? Yeah, no, I, I, I'd been drawing uh, since I was very little. Uh, you know, about uh, about the time that I discovered my father's baseball cards, I had already been drawing for a few years. Um, you know, being being a child of, uh, of the 80s, I, uh, I grew up on, like, you know, G.I. Joe and He-Man and Thundercats. So, like, that's the kind of stuff that I drew. Uh, it wasn't until, you know, I discovered baseball that I started kind of getting into that. Um, there were a few, like, twists and turns in, like, the art uh, part of my life, but uh, I ended up going to uh, the School of Visual Arts for college, which is a you know, private art school in, uh, mm-hmm. in Manhattan. And... Uh, my intention was actually to be a book cover illustrator uh, in like the science fiction and fantasy genre. Uh, but uh, I, it didn't really pan out. I, I enjoyed doing the work. I enjoyed the visuals, uh, but it wasn't, um, it just, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't, it didn't tug on my heartstrings the way that I wanted to, wanted it to. Uh, so I, I guess I kind of randomly just did a baseball painting because of an assignment that I had my senior year and something really clicked and I was like, okay, I want to do another one of these and, and another and another. And it's like, since then, oh my God, this is 20 years ago. Since then, uh, it's been kind of like nonstop. <laughs> well, what I love about your art is like you, there's already a story in it because it's usually a picture of a baseball player, but the detail that you can bring with oil painting tells its own story. Like I like how you bring black and white pictures and put the color to them. Like, how do you do that? Like, how do you know what colors they're wearing or like the perfect picture of that person's skin tone? Well, it, it, a lot of it comes through uh, research really. Uh, And I mean, you know, we're lucky in that baseball is kind of like one of the best documented sports of all time, you know, visually and, uh, I guess, uh, statistically, verbally, statistically, all of that. Yeah. So, you know, you're able to find really weird and arcane information like about people's eye color or their hair color. Um, and with me, since I went to uh, an art school um, and I, you know, I did a lot of painting uh, and drawing from life. So it was a lot of kind of life observation uh, where you're drawing from models and you're kind of, uh, you're, you're learning how to paint, you're learning how to draw, how to do it kind of academically. Uh, but at the same time, you're kind of learning about, you know, how, uh, how light kind of hits things and shapes things and, you know, what, uh, you know, like what a, a light from a sunny day might look like on a, on a model instead of, you know, light from an overcast day. So, what I was able to do is kind of take that thinking and take that, uh, take the memories of doing stuff like that and try to kind of apply it to these black and white photos. So when I'm looking at them, I'm, you know, I see the player and I see the ballpark and I see the action that's going on, but I'm always kind of paying attention to, uh, like why it looks the way it does, you know, like why, why the shadows look this way, you know, why, uh, the sky looks this way, you know, what's making it look that way. If that makes sense. No, that makes a lot of sense. I it, like I just like I was just thinking when you're talking like the first work of your art I ever saw was last year's Tops collection. The, okay. The 150, the 150 years and the junior card. I'm being a Mariners fan. I saw the Griffey card and I was like, whoa. And then I saw a trout card and the trout card blew my mind because I thought it was a picture. Like I thought oh. it was a photograph, not Thank you. not 
not, you know, oil paints. And I was like, oh, who is this guy? So then I look, look you <laughs> up and I start like really following you because that's when you're doing, you're giving away um, the cards with your auto on them. And I'm a big giveaway guy. So I'm like, oh, I like this guy even more. <laughs> and then I saw the Hank Aaron piece. And that's when I connected with you. Because I actually, like, above me have a photo. It's the 1952 All-Star Game with him and Mickey Mantle. Okay. Like, when they're both, like, sitting there. So, like, okay. I've always been a huge Henry Aaron fan. I love what he did for the game, just not for, like, everybody, but for the black community was so big. Like, of I mean, Jackie brought it in, but Hank Aaron broke the records. Like, right. RBIs, home runs. Like, he showed that, like, yeah, a bunch of white people play this sport, but I can dominate it. Right. Kind of like what Tiger did with golf. Right. And um, so when I saw that photo and, like, the detail you got in his face and then, like, you look into the stands and you can kind of see, like, you're getting, like, details into, like, the background, which a lot of people just miss. Like, they don't focus on the clouds and the and everything. And you bring it all together, which is so beautiful and, and so, like, special. So I, I thank you for your talent, for what you oh, do. Oh, please. Thank you for saying that. I appreciate that. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs> Um, Abe, you got what you uh, yeah. so did you see the our Blake Jameson interview at all? I didn't see it, but I do know Blake. Um, okay, so we were so you got brought up in it, and I Abe did. had some questions for you. Well, questions oh, yeah. about you to Blake, well, and then um, <laughs> so at, at that point, I hadn't really, um, I guess, lo like looked at your work as much, and I wasn't so. I wasn't very familiar with it. So one of my questions, actually it wasn't my question. I just saw it. I was watching the interview you did with Blake and in, in the comments, I was like reading through the chat and then it was asking like, basically if the type of art that realism is, it, mm -hmm. the question, I, I'm just gonna make this clear. This wasn't for me. <laughs> <laughs> But, I'm um, so going to hate you right now, aren't I? <laughs> yeah, so uh, it was basically asking, like, is realism, the, the type of painting that realism is, or a type of art that realism is, is it, like, a cop-out for not having to really be creative, right? And okay. I, I just wanted to ask Blake about it, because obviously his art and your art are, are very, like, drastically different, right? right. And, um, at the time, I didn't know you were, like, colorizing like older paintings and then you know as I looked into like as I was doing just like research for this interview and I was like watching pieces about like how meticulously you research you know very small details like there was a there's a piece where this guy um I can't remember, it was like the Yankees team piece that you did I think he commissioned mm -hmm. and he was like if you if later like you find out something that you did in that piece and then like you broke into his house to like fix it like he would <laughs> yeah right <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and so but yeah, yeah, yeah I, just, I was just wondering like what drew you towards you know having a be so into that like you know very realistic type of art as opposed to maybe more of like an abstract type of stuff right okay how dare you? No. <laughs> hey, Blake kidding. had your back 100%. Yeah, Blake, he goes, can you pick out one of Craig's uh, p paintings? Like, if I put them together, and we both go, no. And he goes, well, I can't. I can. And I was like, <laughs> so, like, I've been giving Abe, uh, like, for two weeks crap about this. I'm like, I'm bringing this up as soon as we talk to Greg. He seems like a cool dude, and he's going to have fun with this. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, it's, it's, all right, it's a loaded question to unpack, but mm -hmm. basically... So I'm, I guess I've kind of always um, been drawn to, <laughs> been drawn, been drawn to realism. Um, and, you know, uh, like variations within realism, you know, sometimes, uh, sometimes I, I, I feel like I'm a little more photorealistic than I am kind of like uh, tonalistic or impressionistic. Um, I... It, it's just something that feels right for me. Um, and what's interesting is that, like, the kind of work that Blake does or that, that F. Dot does or, or any of, you know, any of the, the Project 2020 people or any other artists, I think that, you know, each kind of 
visual language that they have is very unique to them, and I think it kind of feels right to them. Um, I I've kind of like when I was when I was in school when I was in the uh, in art school I I was a little concerned about the fact that I wasn't like painting uh, you know I wasn't colorizing black and white photography then but I was I was interested in doing work that was very commercial which you know typically looks a certain way you know there's certain notes that you have to hit. Um, and, you know, there were other artists around me who had different kind of styles in their work, different techniques, and they were doing stuff that might have been more abstract, uh, stuff that was more kind of allegorical. And it, it, like, you know, sometimes the professors or the other students would really kind of dote on them and be like, this is, you know, marvelous and, you know, you're amazing, da 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 da. And I, I kind of used to wonder, you know, like, why I couldn't, I couldn't think like that. Um, it used to bother me, but, uh, it's, I've, I guess I've come to realize that, like, I do what I do and it's, you know, I, I'm probably in terms of creativity, you know, uh, you're probably like looking at less creativity that goes into my work that might go into say Blake's work. Um, because I think Blake has a pretty unique process and a unique way of looking at things. Uh, and he's not necessarily trying to, uh, achieve the same thing that I am. He's not necessarily trying to replicate, um, you know, a certain random day that happened in baseball history. Uh, and I'm, I'm okay with that. And I'm, it's like, I used to, sometimes people would give me, uh, agita about about this work like they they said that like i had you know decent technique or whatever uh and was a competent painter but they couldn't understand why i wanted to do baseball because the subject matter is kind of kitschy or whatever and i just it never like it occurred to me that it might be kitschy but it never bothered me it was just kind of where my you know it sounds flaky, but like where my heart went. Um, mm -hmm. So to this day, I guess, you know, I, I don't necessarily look at the work that I do as being super creative. Um, you know, I look at like Blake, I think Blake is a lot more creative than I am. And we're obviously, you know, we're two different beasts, uh, right. two different kinds of artists, but I, uh, you know, I I definitely respect and and love what Blake does and what those other artists do. And what's cool is when you can actually, um, when you can actually meet someone like Blake and kind of cross pollinate ideas. You know, it's kind of kind of like what uh, what Mitch said about about you. How you know you guys are are different people. You know, you have different opinions and you can clash. Uh, that's what makes something interesting. So um, I guess that's a long-winded way of me saying um, that I hate you for asking that question. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a, it's a great question. And it just yeah. got me thinking, like, if you and Blake did a piece together, like, that would look so interesting. I don't know how you guys mash up your styles, but, like, the attention to detail that you both bring in your unique ways – It'd be very interesting. Kind of yeah, like how I, him and F dot just did theirs. Yeah, I, I honestly I don't even know how we would do it. Like I if we were to do something, I feel like I would have to do a painting and then I guess give it to him. Yeah, and then and just be okay with that with whatever <laughs> he's gonna do. <laughs> because you know, I love what he does. Uh and you know, I'm a big fan of his art. But you know, I, I have to have like total control over my art and what I do. So to have someone else like do anything to it would be a very weird experience. <laughs> he just goes wild with it. Like I, I have one piece of his baseball card art and like how he just spread oh, yeah, stuff. Yeah. And I'm like, that's so unique and so different. Like nobody else is, thinks to spray paint baseball cards and then like yeah. give them to people. And like, you're like, this is really cool. It's from Blake Jameson. And so there's a whole story in this. I think I was never somebody who's into art. I'm a sports guy, hundred percent. 
through right. and through, athlete my entire life, and then like kind of Project 2020, and then Abe and I were the whole sh- concept of the show first started out just being a short sports show. We we're just gonna take like Pat McAfee's model and do it okay. our own way, and then we kind of were like, let's start talking to people because we wanna we like building relationships and connections. And I just emailed some people up and they're like, yeah, we'll come on the show. And then it kind of just started. Our first person was Dave Sims. The, he does okay. um, the Mariners. Yeah. And yeah. he's big yeah. in New York too. Cause he was on radio in the eighties. And he actually hits us up like that. Like we, I, I message him. He hits us, us up right away. And he's like, I can only do tonight. So like we weren't prepared or anything. Like <laughs> we were just like two dudes jumping into this whole, like interviewing people thing. And like the good thing with like a guy like Dave is, he, he this is what he does for a living so he can carry your conversation right then our right. next person was blake and that's when we're like and then blake's um publishes tony's like you guys need to find a niche like what are you gonna do and we talked about it like right after and we're like we're gonna get into the art game and like the people that aren't athletes like we'll still talk to athletes and stuff but we want to talk to the people that are outside of it doing right. other things that because nobody, like, we talked about it with Lauren, nobody really talks about art and sports. Like, nobody thought they could go together. And getting back on track, why do you paint dead people? Like, dead people, why? What makes you go to the old the old baseball style? Not like, there's so much cool stuff going in today's era, but you, your brain wants to go to the classics. Yeah, yeah, I, I used to... You should tell people that, you know, as long as you've worn a baseball uniform and you're no longer living, I want to paint you. Um, (laughs) I, you know, I I think what it is is because when I, you know, when I was learning about these guys from my dad, you know, the stuff that he was showing me, it was all in black and white. You know, he'd show me books or we'd watch videos of, 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 you know, World Series highlights or whatever. And it's a black and white world. And... I think I saw, I don't know, I don't know if you guys know about this, uh, this special, but uh, it was an HBO special that came out, I think, in the, the late 80s or early 90s. Uh, it was called uh, When It Was a Game. Yep, I've seen it. Okay, so for those, for those who haven't seen it, it's basically like a collection of home movies, majority of which are in color, of baseball from you know the the late depression into the 50s and then they they you know go a little further into like the the late 50s 60s late 60s and some of the other uh, uh the other like sequels to the special anyway i saw that and seeing it all in color like it kind of it kind of made me realize that you know these people like the way that I would go to Yankee Stadium and see Don Mattingly or whatever, that's the way my father would go see Mickey Mantle. You know, like these guys were were in color. You know, they they lived in this world, uh, and it just so happens that the way that they were documented is in a completely drab black and white world, and that's how most baseball fans kind of, I guess, know them. And I was just really, really attracted to the idea of trying to bring them back to life and, and just kind of giving them, uh, giving, giving modern fans, uh, or, or people who, you know, saw them like a way to kind of revisit those players and those memories, uh, you know, in color because you know, today somebody hits a home run and you're watching a game, you know, you're seeing it from 30 different angles and it's in color and you know what it looks like. And I, I feel like me making a painting of something like that, you know, it captures a moment, but it's not something that you haven't seen before. But if I do a painting of Babe Ruth in color and, you know, I, I do it right, hopefully, then it's definitely something that you haven't seen unless you're, you know, 100 years old. <laughs> That's who I was just thinking about. Like, I've always seen Babe Ruth in black and white. Like, I didn't know, like, what his complexion was or the color of his hair until I saw one of your paintings, and I'm like, oh, that's what he really looked like. Like, I've seen him in the video games and stuff, but how realistic can they get to, like, that, like, the realism you bring, like, one of your uh, paintings with Lou Gehrig, like, just the the realism of his face and everything and how, how you make him look blows my mind to, like, you look at the black and white photo, and they just don't do it justice. It's almost like you bring them back to life. Like you give them oh, a second life. You. 
You're welcome. Thank you. That, that's what I try to do, and I, I really appreciate that. Thank no, you. You're definitely bringing it back. Even, like, your, your Joey bats, like, when he threw the bat, like, that brought me back to, what, was it 2015, 13? You, you brought me back uh, to that moment. 16. 16. I remember watching him throw the bat. I remember that. And it totally and then totally brought me back because then afterwards all the fans were throwing right. stuff and everybody was going crazy. <laughs> and I'm like, yes, that's, that's just something like – that like as a sports fan, sports are just moments. Like they're they're like you don't remember a full game. You just remember the little moment that happened. And it's just cool. Like for somebody like you who documents like the old moments that nobody's ever seen. Going yeah. to that, who's your like who who's somebody that like who's your favorite person to paint? Like your favorite baseball player? Like that you get the most kicks out of? Like their story. Ooh. Okay. Uh. That all right. My favorite that uh, like when you that I like to, them that I like to paint, or like maybe my favorite who I might not have painted a lot of. Like you not painted a lot of like somebody like when you were doing the research, you're like this person's interesting. Like I didn't know this about them. Okay, uh, so one of them, one of my one of my big favorites is uh, Carl Hubble. Uh, Carl Hubble was a uh, a screwball pitcher for the uh, New York Giants in the late 20s and 30s and early 40s. Um, he's a Hall of Famer. Uh, he's best known for his screwball. I think his best known moment is that in the uh, the 34 All-Star game, he struck out, um, gosh, I think it was uh, Joe Cronin, Al Simmons, uh, Babe Ruth, Lou Gehrig, and Jimmy Fox in succession, uh, you know, over the course of two, <coughs> of two innings. Right. Um, and what I, I don't know what it is that I liked about him. I think, you know, he's kind of, he's kind of like a normal looking dude. Uh, but hearing stories about him, hearing stories about how he threw the screwball, because, th- you know, screwball is kind of a, uh, like a reverse curve, uh, that he threw it so much that his arm was like permanently twisted That's like crazy. that, <laughs> which is funky. Um, yeah. But also, uh, there's uh, Red Barber, the old uh, the old Dodger announcer, used to talk about Carl Hubble in these glowing terms, like saying that, you know, if 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 there was a game to be pitched and like his life was on the balance, he wanted Hubble to pitch that game, which is amazing because I mean, you know, Red Barber started seeing professional baseball games in the mid '30s and you know, probably watched them until his, his death in the mid nineties. Uh, so that's a hell of a thing to say. Um, and he also used to kind of talk about how Hubble kind of carried himself on the field, how, you know, he, he was very much in control of his emotions. He was very much in, uh, like in control of the situation, you know, had kind of like ice water running through his veins. I don't know why, but there's something about that. That's just very appealing to me. So I think he's, He's the most interesting to me. That's so cool. Then who's the one you've painted the most of? Babe Ruth. Oh, okay. Do you ever yeah. get like bored of painting Babe Ruth like over and over, or do you always do like a different variation of the photo? Will you ever do the same photo twice? I, I try not to. So what what I'll do is, uh, the most I'll I'll do an image of now at least is like I, I'll do a color study, which is just kind of a small five by seven portrait of of a player or whatever, you know, based on one photograph. And then I'll do a larger painting based off of that photograph. And that's it. Like, that's my, that's my statement of the painting. Uh, and I, I don't do it. I don't do it again. And, you know, I try to, I try to make sure that each, uh, each client, whoever it is that, that purchases the painting, if it gets purchased, uh, that they have a one of one, you know, original painting so that they have something special. Um, I don't get bored by painting Ruth, but, you know, I paint him, I paint Gehrig, I paint Mantle, I paint, you know, Jackie Robinson. Like, I I love painting those guys, and they're so important, but I also really get a kick out of painting people that, uh, people that don't necessarily, uh, people who aren't stars, you know, people who, uh, you know, if they looked at the fact that I did a painting of this player, they'd be like, why in god's name would somebody do a painting of that player (laughs) and and then why would somebody buy it um so you know like i you know i'm looking i'm looking at you you're wearing you're wearing your mariners stuff and you know i I used to watch the mariners kick the yankees butts in in the mid 90s so i'm thinking 
I could do a Jay Buhner painting. No one would ever buy it, but man, that'd be fun to do. Oh, so yeah. that's that's what I get off on. <laughs> no, Buhner or Edgar. I mean, the like as a Mariners fan, or like any Mariners fan would say, like the two best things that ever happened to the Mariners were like the '95 ALDS and yeah. then like the 2001 season. Like they're those yeah. two best like seasons that the Mariners ever had. That's it in the 40, 40, 43 years that we've had a team. I mean, that's pretty pathetic, but at least you beat the, <laughs> at least we beat the Yankees. I mean. Griffey hated the Yankees, if you guys didn't know that. Like, uh, uh, yeah, yeah. He hates I, the Yankees. I, I, I heard or saw the, the comment that he made about it, like, you know, about, uh, was it like either quitting or coming to the Yankees, like you'd rather quit or something? Or maybe he said he wouldn't York... play baseball ever again. Yeah, okay, yeah, that's what it is. That, yeah, he amazing. said he um, Have you painted senior? Mm, yes, once. once. Okay. Uh, I did, I did a, a team partial team painting of the the 76 reds and he's he's in there but i i, I do want to paint him again and cool i, I want to like, paint junior again too or like paint them like because there's plenty of photos of them together now right like especially playing in their uniforms that would be a cool one like oh yeah they captured those moments oh yeah i mean they're the those great images of them just like in the dugout you know like smiling and talking to each other that's that's like heartwarming stuff. I love that. Oh, and they got the same smile. Like Griffey oh, yeah. Jr. got senior smile in the drive. Like, and they play it like, I mean, people don't know how good Griffey Sr. was. Yeah. And like how much he meant to those Reds teams and all that stuff. Because Jr. was so good. Like people don't really look into dad. And dad was, dad could like maybe get into his way into the Hall of Fame through the veterans community. I think someday. I don't think now, but it's kind of like how, um, who just got in? Um, Harold Bynes, Br- Harold Baines, Baines just got in. Yeah. Something like that. Their numbers are very, very consistent to that way of looking. But what brought you to like doing the Negro Leagues? Such an odd. Like I love that you did it because not a lot of people know anything about it, which is such right. a sad thing to say because so many good baseball players came from it, and so many good baseball players never got to be known. Nobody really knows some of these stars that you got you've painted. And it's really sad because they're so talented. They just lived in an era where they weren't allowed to go on and do their thing. Right. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I love, I love the idea of painting, you know, some of the, what some people call the, the outsider leagues of, uh, of baseball. And, you know, I, I think like the Negro leagues and Latin American leagues are kind of like the ultimate, uh, when it comes to that, but what happened uh, originally was that there was a, a collector uh, out of actually out of Seattle um, who commissioned. Uh, I met him about three and a half, four years ago. His name is uh, Jay Caldwell, and he commissioned about twenty small, you know, five by seven color studies of some of his favorite Negro leaguers because he's a he, he's like a memorabilia collector and he's also an art collector and he, I guess, just really likes the Negro Leagues. He doesn't necessarily focus on it, but he, he has a, a, a very strong appreciation for that history. Uh, but anyway, he commissioned, you know, 20 portraits or whatever. And at some point um, before I kind of even got started on them, he got it in his head that this year, that 2020 uh, would be the 100th year anniversary of the formation of the Negro National League. So he kind of, he wanted to celebrate that. And he, he talked with a lot of people and, you know, made a lot of connections and ended up, uh, ended up coming up with the idea of putting his memorabilia and portraits that I would make for him on display during the centennial celebration at the Negro League Baseball Museum in Kansas City. So very quickly, 20 portraits became 50, and then 50 became 100, and then 150, and then 200, and the final total was 230 uh, by the time I was done. So it, the, you know, it was just work over, over four years, and it was, uh, it was a lot. Uh, but um, it was like, it's like a dream project because... You get to learn about these players uh, that you typically don't know much about. Um, you know, I, I knew Satchel Paige and I knew Josh Gibson. I didn't really know that many others. Um, and it was like, I mean, 
it's it's hard to it's hard to even articulate how important it was to me and how important it is to me um because you know i like uh, <laughs> i'm a white male and i can't begin to like really understand what it's like to be african american certainly now or back then you know what these men and women went through uh you know personally uh socioeconomically professionally i just you know i i can't imagine it because i'm i'm just in this privileged position you know i'm not i uh, all i can do is hopefully do paintings of these men and women and try to kind of treat that in the same way that I treat my other stuff and just portray them honestly and try to bring them to life and hopefully, uh, you know, hopefully inspire people to maybe, you know, open up a book or, or just uh, read more about one or two of them or whatever. Um, and, you know, create kind of an awareness that, that these leagues existed and that it's, you know, pre shameful that they did uh no matter how successful they were you know for the african-american community and how big a part of it it was you know we should have all been playing together and right. that's something that is it's a lot to swallow yeah no like when i first like did a little research that you were doing it like i'm like that's really cool and then diving deeper and then like sitting there and thinking about about it and like what you just said like going th like like Satchel Paige, for instance, I don't. If Satchel Paige got a pitch in the MLB when he was 18 years old, I don't think it'd be the Cy Young Award. I think it would be the Satchel Paige Award. Yeah, just probably. because I think he would have broke all of Cy Young's records because he had a rubber arm. The guy pitched till he's 47. He won a Rookie of the Year when he was 42. I'm yeah. a very very talented man, and the America didn't get to see him till he was. I don't want to say washed up, but old, like not who he was when he was 25. Right. And, like, that's the sad thing. Like, Josh Gibson, like, people know about him, but you didn't really get to see him. Or, like, Roy Campanella lost a lot of his years in his prime. And, like, people don't know that Hank Aaron play, played in the Negro Leagues. He's part right. of, He played for the Clowns. Right. And, the, like, those things, like, I know because I'm obsessive about stuff, but, like, people don't, and you've brought it to them. And you've – and especially, like, with your artwork and to, in the hobby – too has like people because you have your card set out i've now seen people that have bought that card set on and then on twitter i'm like that's cool that now kids are going to be able to see that because their parents will pass that on to them or it's been bought for them and God. it's really sad that these talented men didn't get the right didn't, didn't get that uh passage that babe ruth lou garrick and all these other guys got yeah yeah you know uh, it's it's like we, we try or I try to, uh, I don't want to say make up for it because you can't really make up for it, but uh, just try to do your best or I try to do my best to, to honor them uh, and to kind of give them, uh, sounds weird, but maybe give them a platform to be known again. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, Jay, the guy who commissioned the portraits, Jay, it was his idea to kind of make, uh, you know, all of these products, the card set and the postcard sets and the bobbleheads, um, because he was kind of hoping that, that making these project uh, products would, would help get the word out, uh, of, you know, the importance of, I guess, this exhibit. And at the same time, you know, uh, portions of of everything that was sold would go back to the museum and would go back to uh, the players' estates and everything. So that you know that's great. But uh, I like now. I I feel like you know I still really want to paint these guys. Uh, I still really enjoy painting them. Like I can I can paint you know full sized canvases of them now. You know I'm not restricted to this five by seven. Uh, uh, you know, dimension thing that I had to do for Jay. And I'm really excited to do it. Um, it's just, it's like something that I feel like it's just something that I have to do. Uh, Which is awesome. Corny. 
well, and their jerseys back then were so cool. Like, oh yeah, yeah, because like I mean, baseball jerseys back. I I think like a baseball uniform. If you look at any sports like uniform, I think throughout the time it it always looks good. Like it's yeah. never been like you know like football uniforms. Like in the early days, they looked goofy with these shoulder pads, and you have a leather helmet. And then basketball players, you have like Bill Russell, seven feet tall, but his shorts are like. Like, yeah, <laughs> yeah, this stuff's gonna fall out. Like baseball <laughs> uniforms always look good, and yeah. then they bring that culture to it with like the loud colors. Like I love the Kansas City Monarchs hat with like the big stripes going through it, and the KC. Yeah. And you look at baseball hats going on at that time; they're very simple. Like the Yankees and why hasn't changed. Like very simple, not a lot of detail, and they have three colors on their helm hats, and like you have like these crazy names like the Atlanta black crackers. Yeah. Like, they're coming yeah. like they're, they're definitely saying what they want to want to say in, in their team and how they came out. Like, like I can't, I don't know what I'm trying to say. Like they, they weren't scared to like be themselves is what I'm trying to get at. Right. And you know, what's interesting uh, is that like I, so I did a painting. This wasn't for Jay. This was for a client a couple of years ago of this baseball player who played for a team called the Zulu Cannibal Giants. And it was, this team was kind of a barnstorming team. It was kind of almost like a precursor to what I guess the uh, Indianapolis clowns became in the forties and fifties. But the Zulu Cannibal Giants, uh, you know, I think they were formed in like the mid thirties and they were kind of taken from, I guess, you know, things that were actually going on in Africa at the time, you know, visuals that were being kind of streamlined into the States. These players would play literally shirtless in uh, grass skirts and they would paint their face like they would be wearing white face and they would have wigs on. And, like this was a real team, you know, that was popular in that era, you know, team that made money. Um, and, you know, it's like you look at an image like that now, or you learn about it now, and it's really shocking. Uh, yeah, but that's it's a powerful what, image. Yeah, that that's what baseball was like in the you know in the pre-integration era it, that's uh, in you know it, it's it's stuff that is kind of swept under the rug uh i think i don't know if it's intentional or if it's just because uh you know maybe these clubs didn't get the kind of notoriety that uh, that some of the other uh, african-american teams did but you know it's important to not forget that they existed you know it's important to remember that you know that that these men and women were you know paid to play the sport you know like that you know whether they enjoyed it or not uh, you know it was a way for them to make money and right it's I th yeah i think you have to enjoy the game to go through what those men went through like you have to love it more than like anything so they didn't they, i mean they made money but they didn't make a lot of money they were treated terribly. They weren't treated like the big leaguers. They were in crap. They like, because I know some of it was like they drove around in like cars or like broken down buses. It yeah. was rough. It wasn't easy. It was like playing in the minor leagues, but like rookie ball. And then think about it like the 20s, 30s, and 40s, how miserable that would have been. Right. And um, the one thing I was happy about this year is the MLB stepped up with like this last weekend with the Negro league patches on all the jerseys. And especially like being a Mariners fan, they have the most African Americans on their roster. They have 10. And like for those guys, like for Malik Smith, like how he were, even though he just got optioned down to, uh, to um, the, uh, the other 30 man roster, like how he wears his pants, like big and baggy, like throwback right. to the Negro league players. And I'm like, that's really cool that a guy who's 27 years old, is connecting with somebody who's old, something that's over 100 years old. Yeah. Like just that, like, homage to what you did for me, I'm going to pay homage to you. Like, you dealt with all this crap, so I'm going to wear my pants like that just to say thank you. And I thought it was cool that they put the patches or, like, Detroit's worn their Detroit Stars uniforms, and we're starting to get, like, 
MLB starting to acknowledge that. Because I think for a long time they didn't. But it was like kind of something they wanted to push away. They didn't really want to talk about because of how bad it looks. But I think embracing that culture and going, yeah, this happened. It sucked. But how cool was it? How cool are these players? Like the nicknames. Like Cool Papa Bella is probably one of the coolest nicknames any player could have. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, yeah, yeah the, fact, the fact that Major League Baseball is, at least this year, you know, that they've been trying to celebrate it, it's great. And it's a good step in a good direction. What I hope is that, you know, this is not just relegated to this year. You know, I hope that it's something that they can continue to kind of celebrate. Um, because I think, I think you're right. I, I think that, I think that Major League Baseball, you know, as an entity, I think it is a bit ashamed of, you know, the fact that they are kind of responsible for, for that happening in a way. Um, you know, the Major League Baseball as an entity, you know, as a company may not have been a part of it, but, you know, the same idea, um, I just, I hope it's something that they embrace, you know, as, as troubling for them that it might be. Uh, I think that's how we learn and that's how we, uh, uh, that's how we move forward, I think. Well, uh, yeah, exactly. Like how they've really embraced like Jackie Robinson, having Jackie Robinson Day. Thank yeah. you, King Griffey Jr. for making that happen. Um, but <laughs> like that day now, like how everybody wears 42 and like, when his movie came out and people are finally learning like what the man had to go through just to play baseball yeah. and like what Roy Campanella still had to go through. And all those guys who like came into the league after Jackie were still dealing with these horrible things. I mean, when Hank Aaron broke Babe Ruth's record, he was getting death threats. Yeah. Like, and that where that's in the seventies. Like, and I mean, when Babe, Barry Bonds went through his run, he was getting death threats too. I mean, probably because he's such an asshole, but... That's neither here nor there. <laughs> here or there. <laughs> but uh, getting out of... Well, we're going to be jumping, like, all around, so we're going to get into these Twitter questions. Okay, Definitely cool. for the people that took their time. I want to say, everybody, thank you for taking your time out of your day to give us questions to ask, right? Yeah, thank you. So I'm going to butcher everybody's last name. I don't read well. Uh, David... <laughs> Oski, he says, love the exhibit. Love the exhibit of his art at the national, the Negro League Baseball Museum. Has there been any discussions of having some of his work on permanent display there? Ah, uh, on permanent display. Yeah, like, is it going to leave or? Well, so the, so the, the exhibit is, it is closed. It, it left, mm -hmm. uh, and it's it's kind of a. The hope is that it's a traveling exhibit. It's going to. Uh, the uh the bobblehead hall of fame uh next which is in milwaukee um and after that i think i think jay and uh bob kendrick uh you know from the museum i think they're in talks of having it tour the country i don't know if that would mean that the museum would own the works or eventually purchase them from jay uh i'm not sure but personally like permanently, I I don't have any uh, work in that museum. Uh, I do hope to soon. Um, like what I mentioned before about doing larger, mm -hmm. uh, you know, larger canvases of of some of these men and women. Uh, I would like to very much do one or two for the museum at some point. Are you in Cooperstown? Um. <laughs> 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 well, um, actually. Uh, I, I, I can tell you, uh, and you'll be the first person that I've told, uh, I mean, outside of my family, uh, I am in the process of getting them a painting for their personal or per permanent collection. That's awesome, so, dude. I, I will be there. Thank you. That's, hey, that's <laughs> so cool. Like, that, that was always a dream of mine was be a baseball player, make it to the Hall of Fame, and you did it in, like, a way not most people would think about it. Like, you're in the Hall of Fame, brother. Uh, I guess. <laughs> hey, it's your painting. It's your work. It's in there. It, it I think it counts. It counts. Uh, yeah. Thank John you. Florence. Oh, this is a good one. Which Grateful Dead songs does he like? Peggy O or Silver Threads and Golden Needles? Oh, um, interesting. Okay. I know nothing about Grateful Dead. Oh, it's time to educate yourself. <laughs> well, so I like, we used to work at a pub. It's called McMinimins out here. And they play Grateful Dead all the time. So I like, I've heard the songs, but mm -hmm. I don't know much of the history. 
Well, uh, it's <laughs> it's uh, it's an interesting history, and you know the people who are into it are are really into it, and uh, I mean That's I'm I've really heard. into it. Perfect. Uh, yeah. Uh, of those two, oh man, I, I wonder. I wonder if it's a trick question because technically, those are covers that the Grateful Dead did, but um, Peggio or Silver Threads and Golden Needles. Um, I would probably take a, <laughs> this might sound like Greek to you if you don't know the dead, but I would probably <laughs> take a, a 1977 version of Peggio over a 1970 acoustic silver threads and golden needles. That's, that's, that's my answer. Yep, that's like French to me. It makes no yeah, sense. that's fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> it's all good. All right, going down, we have Mitch Poet. He goes, Mitch, great name. I know it's a strong name. Um, I would like to know how Greg chooses his subjects. Why one person over the other? Thank you, he says. Okay. Um, good question. So uh, I'd say a lot of... A lot of what I work on uh, is commission work. So technically the client is, for the most part, picking whoever it is that I'm painting. Uh, but when I'm doing it myself, I try, like I kind of alluded to before, I, I try to paint people that I guess I haven't painted before. Um, because, you know, the, the, just in general, like the whole, uh, the whole tapestry of the game, you know, the, the whole history of it is really important to me uh and you know whether you played in the 19th century whether you you know played an inning in 1905 or whether you played you know in the negro leagues or the pcl or whatever uh i just if i if i see an image that inspires me or if i hear a story that sounds interesting and i'll look up that player or something more about the story or whatever that's kind of that's kind of what draws me in. I think mostly if I see an image that has interesting light to it or something that I can bring to it, you know, regarding light that makes it interesting, mm -hmm. doesn't matter who it is. Like, I'll just, I'll want to paint it. Have you painted the Portland Mavericks? Like talking about like the PCL, which they weren't part of, but like, that's like such a, like, that seems like something you'd get into because the, that story is so weird. You yeah. Don't know I, it. I haven't painted them yet. I actually, I've, I think I've only painted maybe one or two PCL players. Okay. But I, yeah, I would I, like, that's, that's like another dream project, you know? Yeah. Cause like, like Portland's baseball that. culture is so weird. Like yeah. <laughs> they, they have such a big one. Like, I don't know. I wouldn't say big one, but like the history is so in depth, like how long Portland's had like minor league baseball, but right. it never could get it to like that bigness. And it was always done in like the Portland way. Like, right weird way and it works it's, it's worked like i mean now the hillsborough hops are they're, they're working their own weird way like nobody would, i mean the milwaukee brewers like that's a beer name but like name your team the hops yeah I mean, that's... that's so in, so <laughs> interesting all right let's let's go to the next one T uh runner on first he's got three for you so i'll just like ask okay. the first one second one boom um do you teach he, oh he goes greg greg is the best um Aww. love it looking forward to the interview questions below do you teach virtual classes? No, uh, I don't. Not uh, certainly not like officially. But if if he's a painter or artist or whatever, if he wants to contact me, if he has questions, I'm I'm happy to help as long as I have the time to. <laughs> yeah, you're a busy guy. Um, uh, how does uh, one commission a piece? That's a question I should have asked earlier. Um, well, uh, you or he or whomever uh, could just reach out to me through social media uh, and we can talk about it. Um, you know, if, if the person has uh, an image in mind or a moment in mind or whatever, um, we can work it out. Uh, you can find me, you know, on all the major social media platforms and uh, um, I'm pretty easy to get a hold of, I think. Well, I was surprised, like, you got back to us so quick with, like, how big your following is to, like, our little following. And you're like, boom, right away. And I was like, that's so cool. Like, it got me so hyped up. Because, oh. <laughs> like, I mean, when it comes to, like, the hobby and, like, sports artists, like, 
Because, like, you you and Blake Jameson are, like, who I think of. Are, like, the kings of the table. Oh, and everybody's, man. like, right there. I mean. Thank you. I mean, you're one of the, I, yeah, you're one of the first artists that I can think of that worked with Tops. I mean, we had, so, like, the Don Rosses were, like, drawn and stuff in the 80s, but, like. Yeah, you were even yeah. like the big guy. Like, well, I mean, la- last year's set blew my mind. Like, I'm definitely going to send you a Griffey card for you to sign it. Like, oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. I I'd love one to. of those. I'd love um, to. I'm not asking his third question because it's part of the rapid fire questions. Okay. Um, Terry Del- Delante, with everything else he oh, wait with everything else he had slash has going on, how long did it take for you to paint the well, it's 200 and, what did you say, 34 paintings? 230. For, 230. He said 100 portraits. 230, I'm changing the question. Portraits right. for the, <laughs> Nash, the Negro League Baseball Museum. Uh, in total, it was about three and a half years um, okay. of doing, of doing like, those portraits and also doing other commission work, but I think those portraits kind of took precedent uh, for a little while. How long so. does a, a painting take for you? Because your detail is, like I've said, it's stupid. Like, and like, not like stupid, like no. that way. Like, it's stupid. <laughs> no, like, like, the way you can, like, just make it pop. Like, I've, over, like, the last three weeks, I've looked into your art and, like, pulled it up, like, really close. And I'm like, how is he getting this, doing this? It's kind of like how Lauren Taylor, like, brings her art, like, into the jerseys. Like, I don't under My brain can't i mean it's broken but it really can't fathom like what you guys can do <laughs> thank you you're welcome um, <laughs> well it, it, it varies from piece to piece um you know the the size plays a big role the complexity takes a big role uh or plays a big role the uh, each of the negro league portraits uh from start to finish we'll, we'll say like from researching to you know, drawing, painting, and having a finished piece, I'd say each one took like between six to eight or nine hours. Um, but I mean, my bigger stuff, uh, you know, I spent months, months. How long did stuff. your Jordan piece take? Uh, it's still taking because it's not done. Uh, oh, okay. But uh, it's taken forever. Um, <laughs> it's what I should be doing, and I, I'm bad at this, and I. I I really got to get better at it. I should be keeping a log of how many hours I put into it uh, because, you know, the guy commissioned it two years ago. And I think I told him, you know, however long I told him the wait would be. Uh, it's just a matter of getting to the point where, you know, he's next in line. Um, the Jordan, I think I've been like really working hard on it for a couple of months uh, without a doubt. It makes me sad because, you know, I, I, I have heard, uh, I don't know whether Blake said it himself or if, it, or if I've read it somewhere, you know, that he can, he finishes his stuff over the course of like a day or two or three. And I'm like, I hate you. <laughs> Some <laughs> you know, of his stuff, like on his live videos, he'll do like a piece in a night. And I'm, like, thing. Yeah. I'm like, how do you do the whole entire thing in like one night? Like well, just the process but so he has streams where he'll like cut the stencil out and then that'll take a long time but like his actual process i guess isn't well it's also because there's a very stark difference between what like how you do it and how he does it right like he's he's got his process is very quick like he finds something he he has like he's very used to okay all right, i need to cut this 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 out and then like he has the idea already and right. like you you're going into you know like the background buildings like the color of the curtains yeah or, like it's, stuff it's like true. that it is and, true and i think i mean like that's really cool but like as we're talking about it like it's very different and i guess i, I want to ask this um how so like why is it that you're you know like the color of the curtains in the background is very arbitrary right like you you could make it red you could make it blue like nobody would really really know unless they're doing the same research that you are so you know like very small details like that are very like arbitrary right To, to us at least maybe not to you obviously not to you but for me like if i look at a painting and like the main subject looks really nice and then like i'm not really looking so far back as to like okay this color is this and you know you're 
how different is the process for you when you do something that's commissioned like a very modern piece like you know the jose batista one the back foot mm-hmm. co- where you know it's fully in color you can literally just look at a picture and do it yeah as opposed to something where you know you were having to do like very deep dives on very specific details and why is that so important for you to get all of those details right where you know if somebody's not doing that same research as you, they would really never know. Right, right. Um, that's yeah, that's a great question. I so basically, if I'm working, if I'm working from a color photograph, and I'm doing a painting off of that photograph, uh, I'm using, I'm almost using a different set of muscles uh, than I am by doing a black and white and turning it into color. I have a bit, I have a lot more room to play in the black and white one. The color one, I, I don't, I don't try to copy the photograph. I, I really, I try to use the photograph as a launching point uh, for at least color choices. Um, you know, I might accentuate things here or kind of push things back there. Uh, but it kind of spells everything out for me uh, as to, you know, what color that shirt is that the person in the, you know, stands is wearing. Um, Whereas with the black and white stuff, it's, you know, it's an educated guess. Uh, I, I really, this is just from my own artwork and my own demands from myself. I like, I'm very, I'm very obsessive and very anal so it's very important for me to kind of get stuff right even even i mean absolutely you know uniforms and ballparks like that stuff of course has to be right but even like what you said you know curtains um please your colors yeah like this is important stuff to me um it um it's just it's part of it's part of the storytelling uh, process for me, and it's part of like it's part of recreating that world. Um, I'm also like kind of weird in that, you know, if I'm doing a, a painting of, <clears throat> there's an instance where I did this painting of uh, of Thomas Wagner, right, and it's uh, a painting of him at uh, West Side Park in Chicago. Um, very wide kind of panoramic view of the park and you can get a very clear view of the stands and it was very important to me to get the color of the stands right as it always is Uh, you know usually what you can do is you can look through newspapers uh, and, you know, maybe find like a little nugget that a sports writer will leave behind, you know, saying, oh, you know, so-and-so hit the ball into the red grandstands or whatever. And it took a long time for me, you know, going through microfilm and, and you know, contacting all these different libraries and, and just researching my butt off to learn that the color of these stands was this red. And... I was so happy about it because I always feared that I would be somewhere giving a talk, you know, talking about this painting, talking about the the Wagner painting. Uh, And this particular painting took place in 1909, this image uh, or this scene. And I'd be worried that somebody, you know, I'd be presenting it and I'm done. And then like, you know, from the back of the room, a 130-year-old man hobbles in and is like, I was there that day, and the color of the stands was not that color. <laughs> so you screwed that up. And yeah, yeah there's always, like, the fear that you're going to get called out. Mm. I mean, baseball in general, I think, is kind of like that, where, um, you know, the fans are anal. And, and if you have something wrong... Uh, they'll let you know. or in a stat they'll yeah. let you know yeah absolutely yeah. Um, um, I, that's why I love you so much as an artist because like you care about that I hate watching like movies or some artists or like anything like when they're trying to paint history 
and they mess it up and they don't fix it. Like that's that's an important detail that not the basic fan or the casual fan will notice or even care about. They're so into like everything else, but like a diehard guy like me who's obsessed with it, I'll notice it immediately and then I can't take my eyes off of it. I'm like, yeah. that's wrong. That's wrong. That's wrong. Because I'm obsessive like you, and it drives me nuts when details aren't matched correctly. Yeah, it take it. It breaks the illusion for you. Yeah. Um, so like, <laughs> you know, it's like different with with Blake. You know, because Blake is not kind of going on that kind of trip. You know, he wants something else out of his art, and you know, Keith Shore wants something else out of his art. So I have Keith Shore. The arms are his is I didn't like Keith Shore right off the bat. I'm not gonna lie. Like, especially as Bob Gibson I didn't enjoy it. And the right. more I looked at it and the more I examined how all his pieces are the same. Like yeah. not the same, but they're similar. Like his character his character, um I can't the, the word like how he draws it or, or how he does his art is uh, the figures look the same, but I love it. It's so cartoon. Uh, yeah. Me too. Like Gregory I... Sifts, like his like how his stuff is like madness. It, yeah, it, it's like a madman working on a piece of painting. Like, like yeah. yeah, it looks like somebody with like I don't want to be rude, but like somebody with schizophrenia just draws all over the place, and he right. throws something perfect, and you're like, you look at it, it's a mess, but then he brings it all together, and you're like, that's beautiful. Yeah, or like, yeah, and I mean, not with his like squiggly lines and stuff. Yeah, yeah, and it, I think that is all like you know totally unique to each artist, and you know I don't know. Uh, you know, I don't know F. Dot personally, or, or any of those people like outside of Blake, and I haven't even met Blake in person. But um, you live so close to him. <laughs> I know, his, dude. His studio is God. Without traffic, his studio is like a twenty-five minute drive from my apartment. So I really gotta, I really gotta get there someday. Um, but I, yeah, the twenty twenty thing, man. I were you approached to do it? I was. Uh, so Jeff uh, uh, Heckman, the, mm -hmm. you know, the guy from Tops, he, yeah. he contacted me earlier in the year uh, asking me if I wanted to be a part of it. And I, you know, I thought it was a cool project, but I, like I had just finished up Negro League portraits and I you know, had almost pretty much just finished up the, the 150 year portrait uh, project. And I was just looking forward to getting back to the commissions that I had because people had been waiting and I just, I didn't, you know, I wanted to get that stuff done. Um, so like I knew that this project would be another, uh, you know, for lack of a better phrase, you know, like another time suck and that I wouldn't be able to, you know, put my attention towards that stuff like I needed to. So uh, yeah, I I did not uh, I did not do it. I declined. Um, Yours would be cool if you like did it because I could see it like bringing the throwback back to how cards were originally done because yeah. they were all hand drawn and then right and like I think that's how like knowing your art I think that's how you probably attack it maybe yeah, yeah. like more with the realism of the painting and I think that would look cool just like how they've all done it. Now I made a mess of my cards that nobody can see. <laughs> I'm like so anal with it too. It's bugging me. Um, let's jump back into these questions. But yeah, while you're, track. while you're looking, I like, I, I wonder how it would have been received. I mean, because mm -hmm. it, let's say, let's say I'm, you know, one of the 20 and it's the same 20. I mean, I guess minus one person. <laughs> like my, my work is very different from everyone Everybody else's. else's. So I wonder if, you know, people would have liked it or not liked it or whatever. I mean, well, it's I just think... it's great that the project was so well received. You know, after the initial like not but, uh, yeah. good reception, <laughs> right? Like at first, like people were like, "This, this isn't working," out yeah. as well as they wanted. And then I think Blake's McGuire card blew up, and right. I really think I, I give Blake a lot of credit for what Project Twenty Twenty became. I think he really pushed it and molded it, and it's like it's almost his own baby, even though you have 19 other people doing it because of how he's brought his show and he has them coming on, talking, telling their stories. And like, I mean, we're kind of doing the same thing. And you have so many others. You have like the Twitter, the Project 2020 Twitter, the guy who, who drops all of them and like brings, like, shows them right away and that coolness to it, where it's kind of yeah. becoming a cult following. Right. And then some of them will blow up. Like, Ben Baller has a huge following already with his splashiness. Right. So then that just, you get a whole different um, 
type of people in the hobby. And I think we're seeing that already when COVID hit. Because do you collect at all? I don't, but I'm, I'm very much like, it, I know what's, what's going, going on. on. Like the yeah, prices yeah, are track. ridiculous. Like it's very, it just keeps going up and up and up, which I love. Like, I think it's great. Abe and I have talked about that. Like we don't like that we can't get our hands on the product. It makes us mad. Right. But at the same time, it's nice to like, I just sold a bunch of Kyle Lewis's. Like I don't have a job. I have a brain disorder. Can't work. But I made a hundred bucks off Kyle Lewis rookie guards that like right. I bought or traded for. And I was able to flip those. 10 of them and i was like whoa i never thought you could do that a year ago you might be yeah. 20 bucks like then like, yeah. it's nice that like that price is there but it's also annoying that i can't go buy his autograph for, like for five bucks yeah i mean it's the hobby is weird i mean especially when it comes to, to the modern stuff because um, it's very it's not even like flavor of the month it's like flavor of the day and <laughs> yes. yeah it's just it's so up and down but what was so great for Project 2020 was, you know, like, just what you said, like, they caught lightning in a bottle. You had COVID, people were kind of baseball starved, and you had, you know, these great artists putting out great work and champion championing what they're doing, you know, especially Blake. He really is kind of the, you know, one of the big faces of the project. You know, no offense to everyone else. Um, but what I loved so much about it, uh, coming from an artist's point of view, is that the artists get royalties, which they did not get before. Uh, okay. when, I, when I did 150, I didn't get royalties. Uh, and I, it was something that I asked to get, but it was just something that Tops wouldn't budge on. Uh, and with this, it's like there's the artists now have incentive to you know, obviously not only put out a great product, but to push it and to bring their fans into it. And, and I think they're doing like such a great job. And it's so nice to see that, that they're bringing, you know, baseball art to a wide audience and, you know, a wide audience that has deep pockets and, and they're able to kind of create this, this own like bubble of a market, like within the market and, you know, kind of like create a livelihood for themselves if they didn't have it before or just better their situation, uh, which is just so great because that's like the dream for any artist to be a part of a project like that. Well, like Blake has built a whole team now. Like he has yeah. so many people helping him out. He's like, I can't do it one man. And I think that's cool, especially his story, like how he came from, like everything he's done, I think he touches, it becomes successful. Yeah. Like just like when he talked about like his ten like his Tinder book or like like his digital marketing career, and he's like, I don't want to do that anymore. I want to become an artist. And then even like at the very beginning of his art career with his street art in um, Spain, like it was very successful. And it's right. funny like how that guy just he like he inspires us. Like I think he can inspire anybody. Like because he just breeds success. And you were like, I want that too. Um, yeah, very much so. Would you ever do artwork for Panini? Because they don't have any logos. Like, would like would that drive you nuts? It would. Yeah. If I'm being honest, it would. I, I was thinking, like, because they do some cool stuff, but, like, I like Panini's stuff that they do. I buy their product, but does I feel like I'm getting jibbed a little bit that King Griffey Jr. doesn't have the Mariners across. Like, right. that bugs me. It's like... Yeah when they airbrush out like chief wahoo now on all on all these cards i'm like yeah it's a very racist image but it's still part of the history like right. taking it away is just as bad as not like you're just not acknowledging it like acknowledging yeah. it, like we're gonna do better I mean, it's still a really cool looking logo it's probably one of my favorites like just how it looks but like it, it's very racist as well and i don't like it because it's racist i like it because of i love the movie major league Right. So, like that. Or like, not to. <laughs> yeah, how, it's one of the best. Yeah, I, I mean, Panini's never. They've never approached me, but I feel like if if they did, what I would do is I probably still, uh, you know, if I if I agreed, I'd, I'd probably still do the paintings like the same way that I normally do them, and they would just have to airbrush them out uh, for their cards because I, yeah. I I don't I don't like that. <laughs> Unless they like yeah. ask you to do like older players where they didn't have it. Yeah, I mean, 
the problem is like I so they have to have the state and everything. Like it's harder to do the older players on cards, right? It it yeah, it depends on the player. I mean there's so much there's so much IP, so much intellectual property, so much licensing that a lot of these companies go through or don't go through, you know, which kind of limits what you can do. Um, you know, that that's kind of, that's a big reason why I don't sell prints of my work because in order to do that, you know, correctly and legally or whatever, you know, I have to have a license from, uh, you know, from MLB, MLBPA. Yeah, uh, Cooper Stout. Yeah, like, you know, uh, the player state, uh, Getty Images. I mean, everybody. Yeah. Like, Lauren you know, explained it. It was dumb. Yeah, it's ridiculous. And the way Lauren does it is, like, exactly right. And it's exactly how it goes on, and she's doing it the right way. Um, I just, that's not, yeah. <laughs> that's, 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 I just don't too. get involved. Because, like, I felt bad for, like, Lauren. She did, like, the Joe Kelly piece, which I thought was beautiful. But then they had to get taken down right away because MLB, a Players Association, yeah. supports all the players, not just Joe <laughs> Kelly. Was like she's like it got taken down, and I was like that sucks because we talked to her like the day it got oh, taken down, the oh day of God. like the painting, yeah. like everything. She's like I pulled it all nighter, like that sucks because the paint, like the way he got his face and his his glasses was so good. Yeah. Um, so 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 hours. Did, uh, mm. and it's just like they cheated. Let's acknowledge that. Like they should get punished. Like everybody who else has cheated in baseball has got like slapped on the wrist or like Shoeless Joe Jackson, who you can't even prove that he cheated. Can't even be in the hall of fame. Who a guy, have you painted Shoeless show? Yeah. A couple times. A couple of, his story is crazy. Yeah. Everything yeah. That, like how he died broke. Like that's so sad. A guy. Who's, yeah. He's, I mean, you know, that whole eight men out story, uh, is pretty, it's pretty amazing. Um, but yeah, like, you know, back back to what you said about Lauren, like that's like that's kind of what you have to uh be okay with if you're gonna make like if you're gonna make your work commercial and I'm not I'm not saying this in a bad way at all, because I think, you know, making it commercial is great. Uh, but if you're gonna make it commercial and, you know, get it in the hands of more people, then there are more hurdles that you have to jump over and more people have a say in what you're doing and what you put out and you kind of have to you know you have to i guess yes, man. listen to that um which is you know it's unfortunate but that's that's just how the world is before we get into the the final rapid fire questions sure. one just hit me how do you deal with criticism like how do you deal when people pick apart your art like because it seems like you put so much of your own soul into each piece. Mm. And like, I feel like you almost don't like to sell your own art because you love it. Like, am I kind of right? Like, you love each piece. Like, if somebody, like, defrauded it, you'd probably, like, be very sad. Yeah, I mean... Like, you well, just seem very you know. passionate is what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Not no. what you do. Yeah, like, <laughs> I, I can't... I'm not, I'm not a lit, like, my, elegant with my words sometimes. No, no, no. I, I, no, I, I, you're saying everything beautifully. Um... Anyone who criticizes me is wrong. Always. No, uh, I guess... <laughs> That's how we feel. <laughs> no. I mean, the thing is, criticism, I'm totally fine with criticism. Uh, because, you know, obviously everybody, everybody has a different idea of what something should look like. And I do my best to kind of... Uh, you know, to, I try to make sure that everything is perfect to, you know, whatever it is in my head, uh, perfect before it leaves the studio. Um, and there are things that, you know, people still kind of pick on and that's, it's totally fine. Uh, it, you know, I, I die a little bit inside. I think like every artist does, but, um, you know, sometimes, or maybe even a lot of times the, the criticism is not very constructive. You know, it, it could be, I don't know, like, like I, I had a guy, uh, I had a guy contact me on uh, Instagram uh, a couple months ago, and uh, he just like messaged me out of the blue, and he said uh, something like, uh, "I'm calling you out. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't know why you call what you're doing uh, art. You know, you're just taking photographs and and like 
uh, running them through Photoshop filters or something like that, you know, I'm, I'm calling you out and you shouldn't be doing this. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> and, you know, I, I wrote him back and I, I was probably a little more biting than I normally am, but, uh, um, you know, you're going to get, I think whenever you're going to do anything creative, you're going to get criticism. Uh, and it's just something that you have to kind of develop, uh, you know, a thick skin for, um, you know, being a, being a creative, you know, you deal with, I think more rejection than you do, uh, acceptance, uh, it's just it's kind of it's like part of the game um and i'm okay with it i i try to i think that if people have criticism of my work in for any reason or whatever i'm usually able to find you know a little nugget of something that i can think about and ruminate on and maybe improve on um and that's kind of like the best i can do because you know everyone has a different idea of what the art should be i guess right well uh, why i ask that is because abraham is weird our own bubble where Everybody, well, so I don't take, if you don't respond to me, I don't take it as a no. I take it you didn't see the message. Because mm -hmm. a lot of the people, you just don't see it. Like, you get so many DMs from so many different people that when you have a big following. But we've only had one person, F. Dot said he'd want to come on the show, then he's too busy. That, and, but then Tony's like, he'll get him on. So that was like our one kind of no. We haven't had any bad criticism. So we're kind of like, we've been waiting for it to come, but okay. it's just, like, we haven't got that no or that rejection feeling. Like, like when we wrote Blake, Blake said yes right away. When we wrote you, we were never expecting big names like you guys to say yes. We were just kind of going for it. Like, our whole, like, theory with this is just go balls out. Like, we're going to just go for who we want to talk to. And if they don't message us or if they say no, like, it's no big deal. We'll find somebody else. And we're going to talk to anybody. Like, we have somebody, Terrence Tang, he's just getting into, he does shoe art he's customizing shoes and he's like kind of new into it. And I'm like, that's cool. Cause his shoes, a lot of the stuff he does is like quality and very much on to what we're dealing with right now in this world. And mm -hmm. I think that's something that's cool to talk about, especially when Terrence is Asian, uh, Abe's from is Nepalese and then I'm just a white guy. So like seeing that different outlook from different people than just my own world of living yeah. in Beaverton, Oregon, which is mainly white, which is really cool for that and then we have jeff perlman coming on like tomorrow like those kind of like seeing all the different things is so cool and like hearing every one of your guys' stories especially like how you guys each artist or author does their own thing because nobody's the same like art any way you do art like even even oil like oil painters like yourself it's like you could paint Mike Trout, somebody else could paint Mike Trout. It's not going to look the same. It could be the same right. picture, but things will be different. And that's why I became such a fan of art now and like noticing it and stuff. Yeah, I mean that's that's one of the the, the beauties of it. Um, I mean, you know, I, I was lucky in that I I grew up in a very uh, liberal uh, environment. Um, and, you know, a very mixed environment, you know, there's a lot of African American, a lot of uh, uh, Latin American kids that, you know, I went to school with. And, uh, you know, I, I kind of always was taught to, uh, you know, to embrace other people's cultures and that, you know, if somebody was different than you, you know, it was, it was a good thing and that it was something that, you know, that was to be celebrated. Uh, and, you know, I still feel that way. And, you know, my, my wife is, is Iranian, so she, you know, she's Persian and she has, uh, you know, a different kind of culture, you know, coming from a different kind of home than I came from, but she, you know, she's also a writer and it's like, you okay. see how her upbringing affects what she writes and how she writes and how she looks at the world. And that's, that's what's so great about art is that it never, it doesn't have to like fit into a box of what you know what art is uh it's it always kind of like transcends the boundaries of the box i mean i think you know having discourse and being able to talk and and you know be accepting of each other is definitely a great thing but i think it's also important to recognize that you know you and i as white males you know uh 
we have different things, uh, like <laughs> we have different privileges, I would say, which is, yes, yeah, like, that's the word. I don't that's like true. saying that, but that's just kind of how it's true. It is working in this country at the moment. And I think we are getting to the way where we're going to see change. I think some of it's being done completely wrong, especially what I'm seeing every day living in like Portland, like destroying a city. I don't think it's the right way to do it. I right. think that needs to be brought up with in Congress and in the house and those ways of changing. Cause I don't think violence or hate does anything. It just brings more hate on top of hate. And then you're in a war and we don't need that as a country. I think it takes people that have a platform and who want to talk instead of like, pointing fingers like we're seeing on CNN and Fox News. Like they're always like this and this, and our president kind of does that too, and Joe Biden is doing it now. Just talk and accept everybody and kind of love everybody and say, this is what's wrong with the world. This is how we need to fix it. And I think that's what we really need to do instead of fighting, because fighting gets you nowhere. Well, yeah, yeah. exactly. It, it gets you nowhere. But, you know, again, our privilege is, is that you know, we, we get to watch this stuff kind of from the sidelines, you know, right. my, my wife is, as, you know, a, a Muslim woman, you know, in America experiences a much different America than you and I experience, no, sure Abe, you know, experiences a much different America that you and I experience, especially in New York, like she probably does experience a whole different one, especially 20 years ago, which is yeah. very sad and very unfortunate. And that that is not the way I think a lot think america is like that like and that's unfortunate that that's the mindset that has been created has kind of always been around but i think that's like that stereotypical of hate has been around not just in america but it's been around in human culture from the beginning i mean going down to like Egypt, egyptians like it was built off the back of slaves like all the beautiful towers and the pyramids and stuff like i think we're just kind of by nature cruel people cruel yeah. by by heart, which is sad and not right or anything, but we're on a deep, dark note that I don't want to like you spiraling down, and it's yeah. getting late for you, for you. It's even getting late for my my old self because I go to bed at like ten thirty. Oh, okay. so yeah, I because I have a brain disorder and stuff, and everything I do has to be the same every day. Or like if I get out of my loop, I kind of start getting a little crazy, and like my ticks will get bad and it's all from concussions. Like I was a perfectly normal person 17 months ago and my brain broke right. too many concussions, too many chick anxiety and all, all that fun stuff. That's why like, I really, why we interviewed Lauren. Cause she's so open about that stuff. Yeah. And that was a really fun discussion. Cause I really didn't want to talk about it too much. Like I'll say I have a brain disorder, but I don't want to dive into that depth. And we did that. And that was kind of cool. And definitely she'll, have like special place like her work i have to get a painting like of hers like right. a print of hers because i can't afford like her paintings like a print because like that connection that she's like bringing out mixing mental health with sports and throwing art in it too a lot of like in the sports world it's not talked about like you're you're yeah. tough and you don't talk about your your problems yeah yeah that's that's one of the reasons you know lauren is so great you know she champions uh mental health and that's right wonderful and she's a wonderful artist and, and a great person and yeah it, it's it's great that she does what she does and i'm glad that she's successful and you know still just like another artist i wish i could kind of you know hang out with in person and and you know have a cup of coffee or a beer or whatever even though i don't drink either of those but you know just hang out with uh, but you know she's in like I think British Columbia or something. She's so. in Vancouver. She's close to me. Yeah. I, we should just all, you, you East Coasters, come out to like like Team Mobile. I wanted to say safe go. Team Mobile one time. <laughs> it's safe. Go drive come down. I'll come up. Yeah, say, I always call it safe go, but like now, like having like, I don't know if we ever get big one day. I don't want like somebody to be like, about a year ago, he kept calling it safe go and Team Mobile. Uh, yeah. At me. Yeah. Um, so rapid fire fun questions is what I call this. It's yes, sure. six questions. I'm just going to hit you first thing that pops in your head. It's nothing like super personal. It's just okay. goofy stuff. What's your favorite food? Favorite food. All right. Uh, a tie between uh, New York pizza. Um, sorry, Abe. And uh, <laughs> uh, matzo ball soup. Okay. That's that, matzo ball. Are you Jewish? I am. Okay. I was... 
I was just putting like the last name in the matzah ball soup. Not too many people that are like not Jewish <laughs> eat it. Like yeah, I got it's, a it's, Jewish friend. That's what I know. That's how I know about yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. It's Jewish penicillin. As uh, yeah, as you're the second it. person that's picked New York pizza. By the way, Matthew Lee Rosen picked it, which shocked me because he's uh, a Chicago. Chicago. Interesting. Yeah. Have you seen any of his work? Yeah, I love I love Matthew's work. He does cool yeah, stuff. I've never seen it in person though. Uh, where I got I got a card. I'm destroying my stuff. I won it from because he does cool giveaways. He did um, Mike Hargrove, the human rain delay. So oh, all that's rain great. Drops in the gum and like, because he tells stories through that. Or like, he just did like a giant spoon and like I saw that the one. milk. And I'm just like, yeah. Oh. I wrote oh, it on. It. I'm like, oh, where did you come up with that? Like, like his mind of what he does is so unique and out there. And like yeah, he's I love it. and like being like a fan of the junk wax era and like kind of like those were the first cards I got to collect seeing somebody do something so unique with those when we all just thought they're trash, you know, not too long yeah. ago. And yeah. he's like taking, I mean, that's, that's a work of art right there. Like, absolutely. We're going to take it out of the one touch. Uh, who's your favorite. Now we kind of went through this. Who's your favorite athlete to paint? Um, okay. Well, I'll, let's say it's Carl Hubble. All right, Carl Hubble. For the sake, then, for the sake of brevity, we'll say Carl Hubble. And then, who's your favorite baseball player, like personally? Who do you like to watch, or who was your hero? Okay, uh, I love Lou Gehrig, who I didn't get to watch. Um, but my favorite modern player, which you'll appreciate, uh, was Ichiro. Okay, I love Ichiro. He's yeah, so classy. It yeah, gets classy. The word when and... I think about him, it's classy. Yeah, he, I I was so happy when he came to the Yankees, but I was always like, why why couldn't you come here like ten years ago? You know, <laughs> ten years before you came. I Ugh. think he went to the perfect market to start off his career. Like, oh yeah, because like, absolutely. The, the Mariners have such a weird history, and then like, getting a player of that caliber, and like the cool things they did at Safeco, like the bathrooms are all like they're in English and then they're in Japanese. And, like, there's a lot of Japanese food at Safeco. And, like, right. really, really, like, brought it into him. And they've done that for Edgar, too. Like, in left field, he has his own cantina. And, like, it's, oh, all, okay. it's, yeah, it's all Hispanic food. That's where the, croc the cockroaches are. They, oh, yeah, they do, like, the okay, lamb, yeah, the that makes sense. cockroaches. So, like, it's his own little spot where they gave him. And, like, That's I think cool. Mariner fans are good at, like, the, Mar the Mariners, they're, um, they're, they're, um, PR is good at like embracing their players, like how King Felix had his own court. Everybody wore yellow when he pitched. Right. Like, they do unique things that nobody else does. I think you have to when you're such a bad ball club. <laughs> hey, man, you're right. Lose, you're right. Losing this MLB franchise. Uh, I mean, I've been a Mariners fan for 20 years. I've never seen a winning season. Um, oh. Beer or wine? Uh, actually, neither. Because uh, I don't drink. I don't drink either. I, no, I can't. There you go. Yeah, well, I can't because of my brain disorder, but I'm, I'm not a good drinker. I'm, I get mean, so I decided that's not a good thing for me. <laughs> yeah, I just, I, I'm really, uh, I'm really picky uh, food wise. So, like, the taste, I just could never get into it. I know it's not about the taste either, but being, you know, inebriated, uh, the lack of control is something that I can't. That's get what with. I didn't like. Yeah. So, my, uh, my favorite beverage is Coke. Coke, okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what's your ideal ball game food? Uh, okay, I have an answer for that. Okay, you, you might think I'm crazy. So, uh, Yankee Stadium. Uh, if you've ever been uh, to the old Yankee Stadium, uh, they used to have these large soft pretzels, uh, which you know, is totally plain seemingly boring food you know they just kind of steam it up in like a big container kind of like they do with the hot dogs um but that's what i kind of grew up on uh going to the stadium i'd always get a pretzel or two or three um <laughs> and they're just so salty and doughy and delicious but the pretzels in yankee stadium at the time were not they weren't my favorite basically for that reason I, that I just mentioned, how they were just kind of steamed like that. Outside of the stadium, not on the stadium grounds, but like literally across the street, you have vendors like in their street carts who are selling 
basically the same pretzels, but they're cooking them uh, or they're heating them up on hot coals. So the pretzels from those little carts had like a smoky taste to them. That's what I loved. Okay. Um, Are I you allowed to take that. those in to the ballpark? No, right? You can. Okay. I mean, okay. well, you, you could back then. Okay. Um, okay. Now I don't I don't know what it's like now. Uh, I, Have you they, been? I think, yeah, yeah. Do you but like they, it? No, <laughs> <laughs> no. I, I I like I play MLB the Show video game all the time, and I always choose old Yankee Stadium if I play in the Yankees. It's just it's a cathedral. I mean, they try to do that with a new one, but it's like if you ever tore down Wrigley, like tearing down old Bush made me so sad. Like my stepdad's from St. Louis. Like New Bush is a really unique ballpark. Yeah, it's like, beautiful. Just how they had the old like columns going all the way around it, like don't mess with what ain't broken. Like tear down the kingdom. I was fine with that. Like when they did that, blow that thing up. That was ugly. <laughs> Safeco, I and it's I didn't always like Safeco, and then once you go there enough, you start to fall in love with its uniqueness. I do feel like it's a giant warehouse sometimes when it's empty, but it, they they did some oddities in that ballpark. That's interesting. But like tearing down Fenway, I think would be like. Even if baseball stopped existing, like just keep that there. Like that's a monument. Yeah, One yeah. Thing yeah I, like, I, occurred there. I have friends, uh, uh, a lot of friends who were Mets fans, and uh, oh Shea, you know they, they talk about Shea, and you know Shea was uh, Shea was a, a dump. Um, yeah. but they had no you know, people they say, yeah, but they say it's it's our dump, you know, right? And so like that's that's important, um, and you know the old Yankee Stadium obviously which is different from the yankee stadium that my father grew up with right um it's uh it was something special um it really was i mean the the way the enclosed uh, how enclosed it was the way it kind of reverberated sound uh the new stadium doesn't have that uh it doesn't doesn't sound the same it kind of uh it comes across as looking and feeling like uh costco to me okay so and like the new mets ballpark city field like that's a gorgeous warm and friendly ballpark i like so. when they take like the classic modern look like what they did with camden yards like oh yeah it's old but it's a new stadium like that brick feeling you know the huge brick old brick building on the background like just the the art they put to it and then i like the rangers new ballpark don't like it at all it's, it's yeah. too it's like same thing yep yeah yeah. yeah, it's, it's not. Just, it doesn't yeah. have the story. Like I love the ballpark of Arlington, but I understand no one wants to play baseball when it's 110 degrees in summer of Texas. And then last question, I will judge you on this. Favorite baseball sports movie? Face, favorite baseball movie? I, there oh, is crap. only one right <laughs> answer to this. <laughs> off, my, off my opinion, I, I've your opinion. It. Yeah, my okay. Opinion. Okay. Do I tell you mine first, or do you tell yeah, me yours? Yeah, you tell me yours first, and I'll tell you yeah. mine. Okay. Okay. Favorite. It's between a few. It's hard okay, to... Okay, that's why I have, like, three. But okay. there's one that, like, I it's number one, and then the other, like, four, are like, just, they're, they're, they're acceptable. Okay. Major League is up there. Okay, that's fine. That's, like, number two for me. Um... Sandlot is up there. That's like number five. Okay. <laughs> Fair. Uh, and I think a League of Their Own. Okay. I, I get that kind of accept those. Number one's Bull Durham. I think Bull Durham's the greatest baseball movie ever. Bull um, Durham's great. Just because it brought back minor league baseball. Like minor league okay. baseball is dying. It brought it back. And just the storytelling is a love story. Number two for me, a lot of people argue with this. They don't like it. I like for love of the game. Another Kevin Costner. Listen, <sighs> Costner. I mean, say what you will. The man loves baseball, and it comes yeah. through in his movies. I, I. That's. I'm. I'm okay with that. He went two for three. I think Field of Dreams is absolutely terrible. I don't like it. It's not a baseball movie. It's a Fire and Sun movie. It, it, Thank you. Yes, that's not exactly a what it is. I, 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 I like it. It's very sappy. It's um, boring. But at the end, the you know the do you want to have a catch? Yeah. That that's the payoff. Like that that's the best yeah, part of the that's movie. That's where of you course. like you figure it all. Out. Yeah, of course. I mean, that's yeah. when we really think about like 
baseball, who's the first person you played catch with? Like most people put right. your dad. Like right. that's the uniqueness with baseball. How it, it is um I think baseball is definitely passed down kind of sport. Like some people I think pick it up and just go, Oh, I like this sport. I think football and basketball more have that audience of people can pick that up and like it more. And then I think baseball is more like you're passed down and like my dad, like I grew, I, we grew up in the Midwest before we moved out to Oregon. And like, I remember going to old County stadium in Milwaukee. That's awesome. Yeah. So I went to one of the last games at County and one of the, and we went to the first season at, um, at, at Miller park. And like my most favorite memory of Miller park is we saw Glavin Maddox Schmoltz three days in a row. I still have the tickets. I still That's... have the ticket stubs. We saw him and like him and I still talk about it. Like, and he always gives me crap. Why aren't you a Brewers fan? Like my brother has the Brewers tattooed on his arm. And I was, I jumped around like I was Yankees fan, Cubs fan. And, like the Mariners were that one team that always stuck with me. I like the, I'm ultra competitive, but I like the aspect of how the Mariners are like, it's kind of like the Cubs, this lovable loser. Like um, SB Nation does this six part series on how goofy the, um, the whole entire organization has been like how they barely have ever had winning seasons and like how it's always really bad baseball, but they yeah. like break these weird records that nobody knows about. And that's the interesting thing about the Mariners. Like you never think that the hit King, I mean, well, single season hit King Ichiro, but came from Seattle or like right. the biggest superstar of the nineties came from Seattle. I mean, it's yeah. King Griffey Jr. Like just yeah. weird, like little oddities like that. But the, the floor is not yours, sir. Whatever you want to promote, whatever you want to say. Ooh. Um, okay. Well, when uh, when is this going to air? How about that? All right. What is this airing, Abe? Tomorrow? Tomorrow. Tomorrow, yep. Okay. So there are two things, if possible, if I may. Yes, sir. Um, one is a, uh, a GoFundMe for Lauren. Uh, Lauren Taylor. I don't remember the exact URL, but she is having a, a GoFundMe for uh, a lot of the uh, uh, the expenses or medical expenses for a lot of the surgeries that she's been having. And uh, I would love to see people uh, go and donate to that if they can. We've retweeted um, it out on, on Just Mention and our personals. Oh, awesome. So it's out there. So we okay, definitely great. have it there. I'll pin it so people can see that. Cool. Okay. Um, the other one is I have a friend, uh, Mark Chiarello, who is uh, the former uh, art director for DC, uh, who is having a Kickstarter right now for uh, his baseball book. He's an amazing, uh, amazing artist. And that ends uh, in about a week, and they're very close to funding it. I think they need about another uh, $1,500 or something like that. So I'm hoping it kind of gets over the hump. But... Um, if I can get people to go check that out, that would be awesome too. Perfect. What's it called? Uh, I think it's I think it's baseball baseballs one hundred or baseball one hundred. Okay. I don't remember the exact name, but it's people will like that. figure it out if they want to. Everybody, thank you for listening to our show. It's a we ran way longer than we normally do, but Craig, Sorry. Craig we're going to have you back, like definitely, because just the stories you have and like the knowledge you have of baseball, because. Um, you, you get to, you're kind of your own historian in your own way, how you research everything. Uh, we're my own weirdo. Uh, hey, we're, like we're, we're all, we're all weirdos, especially like in this sport. Um, thank you guys. I'm Mitch and everybody have a great one. Hey, play the music. <laughs>